All right. Hello and welcome back. As of probably yesterday or sometime over the weekend, uh, we celebrated Satoshi and Ash because you call him Ash, but uh, based on the dates, it was Satoshi's uh, date of finishing blah, 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 blah words, right? So we celebrated Satoshi's one year anniversary since the end of his 25 year anime run. And Darian and I wanted to make a video for it, and I came up with the idea of tackling the dumbest theory in all of history, aka the Ash Coma Theory slash Creepypasta. Uh, with me, as always, is Darian. Darian, go ahead and say hi. Hi there. So he's going to back me up on a bunch of points that we have. Uh, I'm going to try and edit this so you guys will see a lot of the kinds of source material that we're pulling from. We did a lot of Bulbapedia, we looked at some anime episodes. And overall, the point of this video uh, is obviously not to be too hard on people from 20 plus years ago that created a silly fun theory that a lot of people took to. This is something that's been covered a lot over the run of Pokemon. And it's to the point where you'll have comments in videos that are like, I can't wait for the last episode when Ash wakes up from a coma. And I'm just like, what in God's name are you even, <laughs> why do you want that? What is uh, Grove Wolf doing? As always, with uh, fans, a lot of times, I, I know like the whole canon versus fanon thing is a big thing on Twitter right now, uh, but as always, fans love to get ahead of themselves and sort of retcon the author intention, and this is probably the biggest disastrous example of that when it comes to the Pokemon anime, um, as opposed to the games where people just slander it just for being turned on. So. We're going to go through all our points. Darren's going to back me up on some of them. We're going to go a little more in depth than necessary because now that, that his run is over, I think it's appropriate that we finally put this fun little uh, fan theory to rest. So the Ash Coma theory, as you guys should know, is about episode one. At the end of episode one, Ash uh, and Pikachu fight a horde of Spearows. And Pikachu, using its lightning rod ability, absorbs a massive bolt of lightning and uses the electricity to make a, you know, a big AOE attack to take everything out. And so the theory states that from that point on, Ash is in a coma, meaning literally everything from episode two onwards is just a complete dream. Well, I, I mean, Darren, you should probably include like the ho oh at the end of episode one. So every, everything, everything's a coma. So let's first tackle the idea of Ash falling into a coma to begin with, and that being a prolonged uh, state that he's trapped in. Now, there are Pokemon that interact with the realm of sleep and dreaming and nightmares. Uh, the main two examples are Hypno and Musharna. You also have Darkrai, which is going to be exception because there's outside of him battling uh, a trainer that we'll talk about later. There aren't really many anime appearances for Darkrai, but Darkrai is a Pokemon that does exist. And then there's also Kamala. Now, I'll, I'll try and ask Darian to interject here in a second, but what I stated first was that Musharna at the time of episode one is a real Pokemon in the world that exists. Ash is very limited in his knowledge and Oak even is pretty limited in his knowledge seeing that he is also from the Kanto region. And so while there are a lot of Pokemon out there that have always existed that weren't even created yet, in the lore of the anime, it makes sense to believe that all these Pokemon from Gens 1, 5, 7, and 4, all these sleep-related Pokemon exist at one time, and it makes sense that these are Pokemon whose phenomena have been studied and could potentially be applied for medical uses. Uh, so, Darian, let me know. What, do you have to, what did you have to add on this part here? We, we just um, had like a whole conversation just yeah for. the only other part is i know we've mentioned that dark ride didn't really make much of an advance of uh, 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 um appearances we're not really counting movies because i know those are kind of their own set that's right entity. that's right um so we're... movies aren't really going to be touched upon a lot in this but other than that the one i really found was kamala and i also while you were doing research found um some pokedex entries for ho-oh and the only thing it mentions is Seeing one can bring so many eternal happiness, which right. probably automatically disproves the theory there because he went through a lot of trials and tribulations on his journey along the way. Yeah, so, true. <laughs> true. We'll but, get into um, that. Yeah, we'll get. Yeah, that's. So yeah, later. like yeah. Darian um, added, super important. We are not using movies as a part of the canon. Uh, there's a lot of articles. There might be even some parts of the theory that go into detail with the first Pokemon movie or any of the Pokemon movies and use those as reference. That stuff's just not canon. Um, that's just the way it is. That's how it works. 
um, the movies are their own separate events, and they are almost never, if ever, mentioned again. And that's usually how it works with anime. Uh, which is something we're also going to reference a lot as well in this video. And then finally, Chester Berries exist. <laughs> so, I mean, surely, it, surely they know how to treat Chesto berries, wake up slap is a move. wake up slap is a move. Go get him, go get him, give him a little slap. They have. There's also a very niche move that doesn't exist anymore called smelling salts. Yeah, that's a move that I don't even. I really don't think that move exists anymore. I know Hariyama uses. Hariyama uses that. The only person that. I know who learned it, to be honest. So yeah, I it, there there has to be a way to wake someone up from a coma. That's just that uh, that just doesn't seem logical. And when Darian mentioned Komala, I also talked about how there are infinite amounts of people researching Pokemon. Surely somebody has used Kamala as a reference point to research Komas, and there has to be some, there has to be something there. Uh, so the second part that we're gonna tackle uh, are the appearances of Nurse Joy and Officer Jenny. Uh, they're leaned on heavily because they are a multitude of people that look exactly the same. And as unbelievable as it is in real life, in fiction, it's, it's about the suspension of disbelief. Uh, can you personally believe that a bunch of people in the same profession are look exactly the same, are all related, and they exist across the entire world? Uh, obviously, no. I mean, most people, I, I think, wouldn't be able to believe that in outside of a work of fiction, but it's it's exactly how it works in the games as well. Uh, Darian, before I go through my list, is there anything that you want to speak on in terms of the Nurse Story and Officer Journey part of the theory? Uh, no, I'm pretty sure you'll get to that, but the only one of the things is, um, like you said, I know we'll talk about it with Joy being, and Jenny being, like, the family name, and mm. like you said, it's, it is pretty... Yeah, go, yeah, go ahead and bring that one up, because that's an important one. So, I was doing a little bit of research, I think it was the Nurse Joy Bulbapedia article, and it was talking about how it is it says as revealed in Drifloon in the wind which is an episode from the diamond pearl episode 28 mm -hmm. joy is not the first name of these women but it's a family name right and they're based off of the end game nurses and i scrolled down a bit you can see they have a little bit of a difference based on how they look in each region and also the character sync version says two young joys named marnie and paige so it shows that they are different people. Um, same with Jenny. I didn't find as much about Jenny, except she had a someone named what, what Mabel. I guess, I guess it, it, it was just. It was said they described her as an officer Jenny who was just part of this random episode. Uh, was it Mabel? Marble. Marble is an young officer Jenny in the character today who appeared in Luxray Vision, which is another Diamond Pearl episode of the anime. Right. So. And so her name would be like Marble Jenny. Then, right yeah yeah so i it, it, it just goes as far as family business and good genes i as a as a completely theoretical example right um my younger sister has had two kids now and they both look exactly like her and my grandma's genes are pretty strong when it comes to the women in our family uh to the point where even my younger sister looked like our grandma when she was a baby so i mean it's not impossible the suspension of disbelief just goes a little further than it would in real life and the other examples, I'm gonna pull this up and use this in the editing. Now, this is just a staff of doctors. Uh, because again, the reason why it's prevalent in the theory is because these are people that Ash is familiar with. And uh, as we'll go over later, the brain can't really create new faces and people. Uh, even when you're dreaming, you always will pull from what exists because your brain is limited in that capacity. But it's very normal for you to go to a center and just have a whole host, a whole gaggle of doctors, right? Just mm -hmm. available. This is like a five page thing uh, going over doctors from a certain region. Yeah. And for all we know, Nurse Joy could just be like the front end person. And then there's a. There's well, no, we do know Nurse Joy that. handles everything because we've seen yeah. her treat Pokemon. But that's just for the Pokemon world. Yeah. And. Nurse Joy is far from the only nurse in the entire world. It's just that they have a monopoly yeah. on the Pokemon centers. Because those are Pokemon centers. I would think actual hospitals for people treatment would have. Right. Would probably have different people, yeah. different professionals. That's right. Uh, and then it's also not impossible for other people to learn medicine. Uh, for example, Brock ends up becoming a de facto doctor. Um, he also is, later on establishes himself as a Pokemon breeder. Uh, he collects Pokemon outside of the rock type as well. Um, and 
I also added that the Joys and Jennies being related and all looking the same could also just be a gag by the showrunners, or it could be a limitation on overall character design budget so that they don't end up doing a lot of extra work when producing the anime. And like I said earlier, that's just how the games work. You go into a Pokemon Center, you see the same damn person for nine generations of games. It's ridiculous to to um <laughs> to go that far when that's literally how the games work. And this anime is supposed to be advertisement for the games. So it'd be really weird if Ash walks to a Pokemon Center and sees a completely just some random guy. Just, just some random dude in a white coat. Um and I'm sure that has happened over the years in the anime where there's been like a Pokemon doctor and it's just some guy in a coat. But they're trying to keep it consistent with the anime and they want to keep the anime consistent with the games. Yeah. All right. So. Point three. Ash's age never changes. That's a hard. It's a hard sell to like to quote unquote debunk. But it's also a ridiculous point as well. Um, because again, it's an it's a television show. <laughs> SpongeBob has not aged in 25 years, but that doesn't mean SpongeBob's in a coma. Um, Timmy Turner doesn't age in 15 years. Uh, the Teen Titans don't age in their show either. And most of the time, these shows, even when they're serialized, don't give you an exact idea as to what time of year there it is. Uh, when you play Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, for example, uh, Darian, as you know, Mount Coronet and those areas tend to be more snowy regardless of the time of year. And black and white is the only time in the franchise that the games even attempt to tackle nature and yeah. uh, seasons. Uh, so, Darren, before I, again, before I go through my list, uh, let me know if you have anything to add on Ash's age. The only other thing is, I mean, there's, I think those shows like Fairly Odd Parents and things like that have had birthday episodes, but right. still refer to them as whatever age they came into the thing. And, of course... Yeah, or they age by, like, a year. Yeah. And that's but it. they never really... They, they don't go they back do, to really, another yeah, birthday episode. Say, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. That that does make sense. Because, yeah, I, we, Ash could be 10. He could be 11. He could be 12. You know, his journey could have taken one year. It could have taken two years. It could have taken three years. But it it's never been to the point where he is just physically older. Um, some of his designs and the way that his costumes work could allude to it. Like, like XY, Darian. Would you say XY makes Ash look older? A bit. I remember watching an old Jay Witz video about why Ash never ages. And like, wait, look at the new promos for the black and white. Doesn't he look older? And they're like, nope, they just gave him teeth. And honestly, something <laughs> simple as that, where they just literally just outline his teeth, mm -hmm. makes him look older. But yeah, you can see like the way he dressed, and especially as the characters progress and how he handles himself, you can see I, I, like he's not growing older technically, but he's maturing. Right. Yeah, so he's definitely getting older, I guess, in his mind, I guess, for the way he acts. But... Right. But here's another thing. If he's in a coma, and he is getting older, right? Like, physically, yeah. he is getting older. He wouldn't even be able to reference that in the coma. So it makes sense that people want to dig into that aspect. Because just like how I said, the brain needs new experiences in order to continue producing dreams and memories uh, and all, you know, all that good stuff. Um, the point of the matter is, we don't have a timeline as to how long Ash's journey takes, but it is safe to say that if we just run through all the events of Ash's journey, it, there's nothing about it that, there's just no time skip. There's no like, oh, this had to have taken a month. We know that traveling place to place might take weeks, but for example, if you wanted to go across all of Europe, that would not take you years to do. If you want to go on a trip across Europe and see a bunch of different places in Europe, that's not going to take you years. That might take you weeks. It, might, it definitely could take you months. But if you speed run and you're just going from one point A to point B and you're maybe spending a day or so in major cities, you could get across like all of Europe in like a good year or so. Um, yeah, especially because Texas as a state is larger than some European countries. Right. Like Texas looking at the map is bigger, is about the size, is almost as big as Germany is. So, right. And tur like tourism is a very normal thing. 
<laughs> and Ash yeah. is very much a tourist to every region. And then you have to, have to also understand scaling wise, right? Like, yeah, I I am underestimating how long it's gonna take to journey across all of Europe. Traveling across the entire world could take years, but it's not necessarily that he's living anywhere. He's he's traveling, and traveling very much can reduce the amount of time that you go to. So it's for example. If I wanted to go to uh, a place like France and see all the major parts of France um, and it, have a day where I experience... It, it doesn't take me weeks to do that. Um, if I'm just going to specific hotspots, like for example a Pokemon gym or the Pokemon center or uh, seeing a festival event, that's the, or, or, or competing in a contest, all that stuff happens in the course of a day. And in the anime... Episode by episode, we see them traveling from place to place and experiencing something over the course of a day, or maybe over the course of a day and a night and a morning. It like he's not really <laughs> he's not really committing vast amounts of time to any particular place. So, and so, obviously, if he's aging, and if his journey doesn't require him to take twenty years out of his life, then it makes sense. But the other thing that I wanted to mention because I kind of dragged with that one. Um, when it comes to sub versus dub, when you're reading subtitles, direct translations, uh, for example, in anime, Kids Curse, you might get translations towards like damn or shit um, or fuck. Uh, but in the dub, a lot of material is changed for the purposes of their own interpretation. So any mentions to age or time uh, in the dub might not necessarily be canon to the original property. And in addition to that, it's very, very common in early 90s and uh, 2000s franchise anime like Yu-Gi-Oh! Um, for the series to start one way and then get, they, they sort of rough it out, set up the rules. That's why you have banned episodes like the gun episode or the episode where James has tits. Those episodes are cut because they don't fit the overall image that they ended up going for. But they also change the formula and whittle it down to something that they can reproduce over a longer period of time. Um... Uh, Darian, as you know, they in originally wanted to end the series with Gen 2. So everything from the Gen 1 anime to the end of the Gen 2 anime might have been produced a little differently uh, leading into the creation of Ruby and Sapphire. Which would then say, okay, Pokemon might last a lot longer. How should we produce the series from now on? How is the anime going to look with these new games? And so on and so forth from Gen 3 onwards. It's are very clear how episodes are going to go, what to expect in these episodes, leading up to like Gen uh, 7 and 8, which changed things drastically. Yep. Uh, let's see, do we have anything else to add? for the Oh, well, the Yu-Gi-Oh! example, for uh, everyone knows famously, the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime uh, did not play the card game by the rules for the longest time. Uh, and it was, wasn't was until like the third arc that they truly started using actual rules and how they played the card game and then you get to Yu-Gi-Oh gx and everything's standard and everything makes sense and it works the same way as the card game uh all right so anything else on that point i think i think we killed that one yeah we did we did good on that one all right okay so so darren unfortunately i'm going to <laughs> i'm going to once again take 10 minutes to just speak that's fine because this uh, this was the research that I spent the most time doing. Yeah, I'm going to quickly run through every major uh, comp competitive experience that Ash has had from Gen 1 all the way up to Journeys. So, in the Indigo Conference, he loses to Richie in the uh, top 16 his, because his Charizard did not obey. Now, Richie, I believe, is the other kid that looks exactly like Ash with a Pikachu with some froofy hair. Uh, and that marks the inexperience that Ash has going into his first tournament. We don't know who won the Indigo Conference, but Gary actually placed lower than Ash in the top 32. Don't remember if they battled. It's not important to this. And then he lost to Richie, and Richie placed in top 8. That loss was very specifically is set up to say Ash is not ready to be a Pokemon Master by his own merits. And he's definitely not ready to win a conference. Now, uh, Darian, how many of these uh, season finales have you seen? Not a lot. I'm. I never was a big. I'm not a big Pokemon watcher. I like. I recently just started watching around journeys. Yep. yep, yep. The one I think I've seen the most of. But we'll get to it. Will be the Lily of first, the Valley. Versus Tobias. Yeah. yeah. That's the most. That's the most egregious one for sure. Yeah. That's the only one I really remember. All right. So um. So yeah. So that I mean I remember 
being young and seeing reruns of that that whole tournament it, it was a good tournament um but the key thing is like quite literally ash only lost because he had a charizard that did not obey him um he did really well in his battles overall but then you get to the johto league uh the johto league silver conference where he, we already debunk the entire coma theory because this time charizard works alongside him and they are able to uh, fight their way to a slightly higher top 8 performance. He does end up losing to a dude who came over from Hoenn, which kind of feels uh, a little cheated. But then again, Ash isn't from uh, Johto either. Uh, he was to a Blaziken, uh, was a close match. And we actually know who won this, uh, this conference. And from now on, we actually have the names of every winner. Uh, some guy named John Dixon wins the whole thing. Ash loses in top 8, Gary loses in top 16, and Harrison, who beats Ash, only goes up to top 4. Um, not much to mention there. I remember the appearance of Blaziken, but we did not try and watch Ash's final fights for this. That's, that's, that yeah. would take way too long. Um, so unfortunately, between Gen, uh, between Gens 1 and 2, that's going to be where I'm most lost on in terms of like the actual outcome. But it is important to note that Ash has progressed. He got a higher performance. He fought with this Charizard, who previously would not obey him, and he is more experienced as a trainer, but that is not enough for him to be a winner. And, um, Darren, let me know your thoughts on people sort of berating Ash's performances over the years when we see him quite literally start off his journey as a trainer. Do you think that at any point between the first, like, let's say the first three generations, that Ash should have won a conference? And again, I know you haven't really uh, seen those, but like, yeah. like from what you've seen of him at his peak in Journeys, do you really think that that was something he could have built up to maybe in a couple generations? I don't think so. Not 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 that fast. Maybe maybe around like the Gen Four. Yeah, Gen Four and Five best, yeah, are where it starts to really pick up. Mr. Tobias came through and right. ruined his chances, but um, if the thing is, I mean, it's nice to have your your main guy win but like if you want to you want to build to where he became nowadays and having him just win off the bat isn't really like as good per se just mm -hmm. so because he doesn't really have much to the he can still develop but like not right. as much as he would have after taking the losses figuring out what he did wrong and how he needs to improve as a trainer um but like it's like i said it's not too I don't know if he really had a chance, to be honest. Yeah, um, well, get, yeah, actually, good point, because we're going to get to that now. Uh, the Evergrande Conference, Ash loses to a guy named Tyson, and I, it's this is one of my favorites, because he has a Meowth that's dressed up like Puss in Boots, and just like how Ash's ace is like a not fully evolved Mon, his ace is also not a fully evolved Mon, or I should say like his partner Pokemon, they, they both had stronger Pokemon. But um, Ash does end up losing... Uh, versus this Meowth, and just like how, um, well, okay, John Dixon wins the Johto League Silver Conference, and that guy's basically a complete nobody, but Tyson, the guy that beats Ash, ends up becoming the winner of the whole thing, and it's important to note that a lot of the people that he fights in the Gens 3 and 4 anime, in these conferences, the people that are going really far, a lot of these people are much older than him. They look physically like full-on teenagers to young adults. So, again, just like how Darian was saying before, how believable is it that such a young competitor, he's not a genius by any means, he, he's a, he, he has great battle sense, and, and in, that, in that right, he does later on, as Darian has seen in the Journeys anime, he evolves into a trainer whose battle sense is properly ripened to the point where he's always a wild card in fights. He became known in the Masters 8 tournament as a complete wild card that you cannot predict. But to get to that point, again, he has to fight a lot of more experienced trainers. And so then we go to the most infamous example of Ash being defeated um, in one of these conferences, the Lily of the Valley Conference, where Ash loses to Tobias, whose team, as we have seen, was like a Latios, a Latios and a Dark Ride. And, and it took all of Ash's Pokemon to beat Latios. And then his second Pokemon was a Dark Ride. I believe, or or it might be the other way around. He might have always Pokemon might have fought a Darkrai, and then he sent out a Latios. I don't really remember off the top of my head. Um, Danny, correct me if you know, but uh, 
In terms of performances, you have Barry and Conway who end top 16. Ash does defeat Paul to go up to the top 4, and then immediately gets whacked by this older guy with legendary Pokemon named Tobias. So again, I, first, first and foremost, we already established that Ash has progressed from top 16 to top 8. And then we get to, t uh, to Gen 5, where he, again, finishes top... Oh, sorry. In the Lillian Valley Conference, he finishes top 4. And then we go backwards in the Gen 5 Beatrice Conference, where he loses to Cameron, who looks like a straight-up youngster from... Or, like, one of the Ninja Boys from Gen 5. And he loses to him uh, when he previously had a top 4 finish. So when a lot of people say that he stagnates, it's from top 16 to top 4. That's that's pretty good variance. Uh, Darian, I... Important. Yeah, Dane, I know you're a very big uh, sports guy. Uh, uh, you know, put, uh, put your two cents in there. Like, what do you think of, like, a person who can develop from top 16 to top 4? Like, w would you not just count that as a person who's gotten better or more experienced? Yeah, definitely. One of, one of the guys that instantly comes to mind when you think about that is his name is Giannis Antetokounmpo. He is a Greek basketball player who was drafted in 2013, was a virtually unknown guy. He came in, he was like 6'11", but he was like 200 pounds, Wild. super slight, really small. And for the first like two or three years, he was a serviceable guy. And then one year he just exploded. He came back, he was like 230 something pounds now. He's super athletic, really fast. So yeah, over time, getting from the 15th draft pick in a relatively weak class, so, this 2013 isn't really looked back upon as a good class of rookies that came in. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll, you were picked 15, and in that same class, there was a guy named Rudy Gobert, who was drafted in the second round, like pick 50. He became one of the best, um, one of the best shot blockers and defenders in the league. So, just like you said, Ash is a wild card, you find all these sleepers in whatever draft. Oh, yeah. In a, yeah. any sport, there's always Tom Brady, widely regarded as the greatest football player ever, won like seven Super Bowls, was a sixth round pick, like the yeah, that's, 200th that's, pick in the draft. Yeah, that's straight up dumpster. There's pick. a there's a there's a term for miss called Mister Irrelevant when you're the final pick in the draft, literally seventh round pick, thirty two, guy named Brock Purdy. This year he played for the Super Bowl because pe people miss these guys all the time. So wild cards and sleepers are. Yeah, you can never count them out. So right. No, going that makes that's. Where you are I think that's perfect because to where they become is definitely, it's definitely proof. Definitely. Yeah, because even though I ragged on him, he does lose to Cameron, a guy that's like around his age. Um, after he's had these very nice season fights in like three other massive uh regional tournaments, but yeah, I mean, a like Ash is supposed to be an underdog for the most part. And they do also, I think we can get into the whole Ash restarting his journey uh, part of the theory. I mean, like, what? Wait, what do, you, Darren, do you have any thoughts on that? Because I don't even know what to say with that one. This is yeah, kind I mean, this, uh, this was also supposed to debunk that as well. Because, again, we're going through Ash's entire competitive journey here. So, Darren, um, mm -hmm. let me know what your thoughts are here. Um, starting over... I mean, I guess it could make a little sense. Uh, maybe they want to be more in line with the games because as you go into a new region, you have your brand new you, Yeah, games. you start over. Yeah, and I know, as we've seen in the anime, gym leaders can use stronger Pokemon, but... That's true. I honestly think it would be kind of boring from a watcher's viewpoint to just see him just bring over the exact... Can, can you imagine? Because we've seen all the cool Pokemon he's used over the years. Can you imagine this is for every episode? He used Charizard, Pikachu... Maybe he would get his Bulbasaur and Squirtle to evolve eventually. So he has right. three Kanto starters. He'll have Pikachu and like, the, the, like, so it, it would just make sense. He would want to train. He wants to become a Pokemon master, mm -hmm. and you're gonna, you're gonna have to probably use more Pokemon than just the beginning. You can't really call yourself a master if you just right. use the same Pokemon over and over and over again. And you know what? Yeah, uh, I think the best point you made there. Who is going to go into a like, okay? So let's. Let's think reasonable. Let's say Gen 6, right? Because Gen 6 has a massive Pokédex. Let's say you go into Gen 6. You run into, like, that first Pidgey, right? Because there's, like, a Pidgey or something that you have to encounter. Let's say that yeah. you go in, and you're like, you know what? 
I've used Pidgey in every single game he's available. I'm just gonna catch Pidgey and add it to my Gen 6 team for my first playthrough. Nobody, nobody does that. Yeah, and then you'll take a couple more steps in the gra grass and you'll see flexing. You'll just flexing. Like, oh, yeah, no, I don't, I don't know. A, I don't think I've ever heard of a single person that goes into a Pokemon game and does not catch new Pokemon, unless there's some weird 4chan basement dweller that's so, <laughs> like, hate has like the biggest like hate bulge for Pokemon that they play the new game and then never catch anything new. And oh yeah, the new stuff sucks. So I'm just gonna. Nobody acts like that. And Ash no. wants to have those novel experiences. It's in his character. All right. Hello. So, in the process of me having recorded this video with Darian, I've been watching the first few episodes of the Gen 3 anime because something just didn't stick right when we talked about this point. And the last episode from the Johto arc of the anime as Ash transitions into the Generation 3 arc of the anime is a direct one-to-one. -one. It is not a reset point whatsoever because within those episodes, the first episode of the Advanced Generations anime starts off with Mei heading down to Birch, who is a family friend, to get her first Pokemon. But Ash is currently on a boat to Hoenn, and the problem that he's occurred that, that has occurred between the episodes is that Pikachu had absorbed a lot of electricity from a trap that Team Rocket set. And as a result, it had absorbed a dangerous amount of electricity, which could then lead to it literally dying. And so that obviously will go into another point of Ash never falling into danger after episode one, some dumb point that they make in the theory but the important part is that is the first episode of the advanced generation anime that is not an episode of the johto anime it is an event that happens right between the two episodes we see it happen in we, we see how it starts off in the last of the johto episodes the entirety of that first episode revolves around pikachu trying to he get healed get help and it gets to the point where Birch can't even really help it because it's in such a delirious state that it doesn't know friend from foe. So to say that the Pokemon anime just resets Ash at the beginning of every single season is immediately debunked the first time that they actually transition from the gens 1 and 2, which are more together as one big Pokemon anime, and the brand new Gen 3 anime. So right off the bat, that theory just holds absolutely zero weight. But let's go back and try and get through the rest of his his journey here. Uh, right. The Lubios Conference, which is the point where I was watching the anime again um, on a, on like a weekly regular basis. I, I binged through all of X, Y, and Z. I did not watch all of Gens 4 or 5. I uh, watched most of Gen 3, including the finale growing up. So Gen 6 onwards is when I am watching the anime to an extent. So the Lumios Conference, he fights against Elaine, who was a recurring character all throughout uh, the XY anime. He is also the protagonist of the Mega Evolution specials. And so for him to come in and become this big threat at the end of the anime just made a lot of sense. And he does lose to him, but he loses to him in the finals. So Ash now has a second place performance, which once again disproves the theory that he is not progressing. Then. In the Manalo conference, Ash becomes Alola's first champion, just like how you in the games become the first champion, which is something I think a lot of people expected at this point. It was like, if he doesn't win Alola, when is he ever going to win? And so the anime could have ended right there. But as Darian has joined me and watched week <laughs> after week, the Masters 8 tournament is where Ash is now allowed because he won the uh, the whole thing in Alola. He then qualifies to join the master, uh, not the Masters 8, but the World Coronation Series, where he works his way from the bottom rank all the way up. There'll be like these little nitpicks, uh, these little bits in the episodes where he goes off and just fights a trader because they're nearby to get his rank up. And then he ends up in the Masters 8 tournament where he fights and defeats Steven Stone, Hoenn's uh, champion, Cynthia, the champion of Sinnoh, and then Leon, who is the world champion. And Ash's entire like the entirety of this theory breaks once ash gets to this point so anyone that put stakes into that theory from the first few gens i can understand but you can no longer go through ash's entire journey from gen 6 onwards it is just definitive that ash is finally a trainer of caliber to compete in these conferences and if ash were to continue i doubt he would go in and just win a whole other tournament but he would definitely be a key performer in that tournament just like how he always has been 
Uh, so that is all of Ash's competitive history from the Indigo Conference to the Masters 8 tournament. And the reason why I want to make this video is because Ash finally achieved all of this within the past uh, like four plus years of the anime. So before we continue, uh, Darren, what are your thoughts on uh, just like the, the Cinderella story that was Ash in the uh, Masters 8 tournament? Because he not only is representing probably the smallest region to have competitors but he also gets a lot of like that canon progress from mega evolution in gen 6 to the z stones in gen 7 to the dyna band in gen 8 and he he ends up putting on the performance of a lifetime in that tournament yeah yeah he does it is, like you said it is a real cinderella story because like you said if he's, he's representing alola they literally just had their lead they didn't do anything they're they're still they're a little more like in the games, the traditional kind of region, they don't really have any Pokemon gems. They don't really look at battling too much. So, they, so to put themselves on the map, they kind of made their own league. And yeah, and the Masters Eight was one of the best things I've seen in Pokemon. <laughs> it's, it was definitely one of the more exciting ones, especially all the battles. But that final battle there yeah, was great. But yeah, it it because like. It's nice when your character gets to go through a little bit of adversity because there's having them being this all-conquering world slayer. Like you said, it, it can get, a, it, can get a little, <laughs> it can get a little, it can get a little exhausting, mm -hmm. believe it or not. Yep. All right. So the next vital point that we have to talk about here is Ash only dreaming about what he knows about. And again, Darian, I'll let you lead off with that one. Any thoughts that you have on that part of the theory or debunking that theory? The that was literally the first thing I noticed in that video because they're literally talking about how oh he sees this he sees the joys and the jimmies because that's all he's seen and that's all his brain can recollect mm -hmm. and then he just goes on to all these adventures where he's all over the place in all these regions and I'm like then how then how's his brain coming up with this if he's in a coma yeah if he's coming up he's with never, 900 more it. Pokemon <laughs> yeah it's just not really logical like yeah. you said, you, your brain can't come up with anything that doesn't have anything to go off of. Right. So, that kind of just throws that away right there. Exactly. So, yeah, as Darian said, from the Johto anime onwards, Ash is tasked by Oak, or invited by Oak, to go across different countries, basically countries. Um, places that he would not have any reference for. Like, if I asked you to, to think about what it's like living in Lithuania, you wouldn't be able to do that. If you go into a coma, you're not going to be able to tell me about the Congos. You've never been there. So if Ash is in a coma, there's no way that he will be able to travel past Kanto, past Pallet Town even. Um, unless he's taken like bus trips to the next city or he's, you know, it, it, he'd be very, 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 very limited on what he could pull from. And that's because the brain has this little thing called neuroplasticity, where new experiences inform the brain and allow the brain to connect back to old experiences. Your entire life and everything that you're capable of is because you've experienced new things and it's actually healthy for your brain but if you can experience new things so in the idea that ash lives for 25 years in a coma he would be dead his brain would shrivel up and rot most likely um but to properly dis disprove the theory without going into science because you know it, the people that wrote this theory definitely have less of a background in psychology than i do but um ash did get permission from Oak to travel outside of Kanto to collect data for him. Uh, that's sort of how Gens 2 and 3 work. And then Gen 4 onwards, I mean, again, he's always pulling out his Pokédex, he's always meeting new Pokémon. Like Darian said, he would not be able to, how is he able to do that if he's in a coma? Um, he's not coming up with Monferno, he's not coming up with Grottle, he's not coming up with uh, all these new Pokémon every time he goes on these quote-unquote uh, adventures. He's just genuinely a guy that survived the events of episode one and is traveling around the world. So the next bit that I think Dan and I both really enjoyed uh, talking about was how Pikachu came to like Ash after episode one. Uh, and there's a going to be a really funny bit, Darian. I'll let you I'll let you start with um, the point that they made about uh, for all of a sudden from episode two onwards, Ash. <laughs> Ash's journey becomes a lot more safer and he's able to have all the fun in the world and you know nothing ever goes wrong um uh, go ahead Darren uh, I want you to once you get into that one a bit yeah so 
a lot and the thing when we mentioned we were looking stuff up is like I, I the one of the points I brought up was we said that whenever Pikachu saw what Ash was doing for it to help save it, mm-hmm. it grew to understand like, okay, he's here to protect me, he's here to be my friend. And I brought up the point was you see this all the time when someone takes care of like a lion cub in captivity. And eventually they release the lion cub into the wild and they'll visit it like 10, 15 years later, and then that same lion, yep, now a true. fully grown adult, yep. will run up to them and remember them because yep. of what they did. So a little bit more of a real life basis, but the fun bit we like to do is, as you know, I like bug types, and it seems Ash has a lot of fun, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of fun times running into hordes of bee drills throughout <laughs> his adventures. <laughs> uh, uh, and there's all these other dangerous things that he happens. He puts his life on the line for all his sorts of his Pokemon. For stranger Pokemon, Pokemon too. For Pokemon he's just met, he puts mm-hmm. his life on the line. Um, turning over a new Bayleaf. Six bee drill attack Ash's Bayleaf. Uh, and then you have, hold on, I'm at, ooh, there's just so many that I'm not going to be able to find it. Uh, in a post ego, multiple Beedra attacked Team Rocket. Um, let's see. There's so, there's so many instances of Beedra's in the anime, and it's not always Beedra attacking. Yeah. Um, oh, in Illusion Confusion, a group of Haunter and Gengar created a Beedra illusion. There's also Malamar. There were, I remember in the XY anime. There was a mention of Malamar, and there was an actual episode where Malamar started po- uh, possessing people's minds and controlling them. There are so many instances in the Pokemon anime where the Pokemon of the week or some random threat comes in and genuinely uh, puts people at risk. But in the world of Pokemon, it's not necessarily that people are just surviving weird odds. There've been I know there's been other theories about how like humans in Pokemon world aren't the same as humans in real life. Well no no shit, because Ash can get frozen, set on fire, electrocuted. Um it's it's supposed to be toned down and supposed to be lighthearted. And part of the fun of those theories is taking those lighthearted parts and sort of um misrepresenting them in order to create a darker narrative. And that's the fun of it. And I, I appreciate and recognize the fun of it. But like Darren was saying before, so that we can move on to our last couple of points here. Ash liking Pikachu is supposed to be a core point in their narrative as partners. It is an is a big uh, episode one event that people can go 10, 15 episodes down the line and be like, they are this close because of episode one, because they went through stuff together, and they're journeying together now, and they're becoming closer as, as a team, and that wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for all the adversities that they found in that first episode. So the next point is that children are allowed to roam the world freely. Uh, I'm just going to, uh, Dan, Dan, I'll give you, here are the points that I that I have here. I want you to talk about them. The only thing I'm going to say is that's literally how the games work. That's yeah, literally the point of the games. Uh, there, but it's, <laughs> just go, go for it. Go for it. It's literally just how it's always been. They say, hey, when you're 10 years old, you start your Pokemon journey. Yep. Like you said, that's how it's always been. And another fun note was preschooler is a trainer class. Preschooler is a trainer they're, class. They're, they're literally throwing four and five-year-olds out. They're giving them Pokemon. They're not, per se, allowing them to adventure. Even though you see them pretty far, but <coughs> logically that could just be outside their home county. Yeah, presumably they, they are always but, local. Yeah. And they are but, preparing themselves to eventually one day become full trainers. So it's not like they're not yeah. preparing the kids. There's trainer schools all over the world. And I also wrote that um, Scarlet and Violet even has trainers that Darian, Darian loves seeing the 50-year-old school kids yeah. <laughs> in Scarlet and Violet. And so it's also something that's very normalized. Uh, the next point is no adult interference. Um, so, as I said at the start of the video, the entirety of the coma theory stems from episode 1. And so episode one is the most important part of the theory, yet the thing that breaks it more than anything else that we've mentioned is how episode one starts. Ash is one of a group of kids that Professor Oak is entrusting with a Pokemon. It is the exact same story as the events of Pokemon's Red, Blue, and Yellow. Now, if kids are allowed in this world where Ash then later goes to a coma and then fakes for for 25 years if this is the same world where kids are allowed to go to school go to camp experiences be trained by professors to understand pokemon on a deeper level and then are at age 10 given a pokemon and allowed to leave town because again 
he was allowed to leave town before the whole electric event that's supposed to put him in a coma. This is this shit's just normal and it's consistent with the games. Um, and then Darian, the final point uh, that he that he and I definitely want to nail that uh, on the head is the idea that Pokemon never die, people never die, no one ever dies. Uh, Darren, I'll, I'll let you again start off with, with uh, point number nine there. Yeah, when I looked at it, a lot of the ones we talked about, like I so said, we're not really talking about the movies, but a lot of them are the movie Pokemon that definitely die. But we scrolled and we looked a few. Yeah, we have... Um... Yeah, apparently a Hunter J's team uh, burns. There's an, an instance where uh, Talon, someone's Talonflame gets hit by Eveltal, uh, Darian's favorite legendary, and then just plummets <laughs> yeah gets yeah, turned to that. stone from a high height that presumably they say just falls to the ground and cracks yeah. so i'll talk about i'll talk about this one but go ahead and yeah, uh, that's the main one uh, yeah, that's pretty much all i had really um, yeah yeah i said until we get to this main one right here right that everyone knows about <clears throat> so okay so yeah so in sun and moon this is the first time that canonically you can just look at it and say this is something that actually happened so uh, Ash is Litten. He meets in the first couple of episodes. It lives in a city where it's, uh, I think it's kidnapping, it, not kidnapping food. It's stealing food uh, for its mentor, which was an old Stoutland. And it is explicitly stated that that Stoutland ends up passing away. And Ash ends up with Litten after the fact in order to take care of it. Yes. Um, but uh, Darian also mentioned uh, before when we were doing research that there are a lot more concepts of pokemon dying in the movies but we're not counting the movies and we don't even need to count the movies because pokemon die in the anime people also probably die in the anime oh yeah Darren, didn't you pull up um another article about how even people were dying how who what? how there were like old people as well that died of old age that was at the bottom of that article i believe was it looking at i think it's at the bottom if you scroll to the bottom oh yeah you also have um some other examples in the sun and moon anime uh, that's the movie. That's movie. Oh yeah, humans have also died in Pokemon. Uh, people aren't the only ones uh, who die. Very few humans have died in Pokemon anime, uh, such as Hunter J. Um, we're not gonna worry about Ash dying because that that's like a couple of different ones. Humans who have died prior to the story sometimes play a role in Sun and Moon. Hapu's grandfather and Kiawe's grandfather are both gone, but their spirits appear in Run Heroes Run. Other episodes such as XY's Seeking Shelter from the Storm feature episode plots that revolve around a dead human and the Pokemon they left behind. So, it's not that the Pokemon anime avoids people dying in combat. Also, uh, we're going to give props to Joshua Fox for writing this article, obviously. Um, it's not that people in Pokemon don't die. It's that the anime does not linger on that outside of specific plot points. And as you can see, most of those examples are from Sun and Moon, which is a more uh, traditional uh, set in Hawaii, set in like a, a local uh, area type thing. So a lot of stories did revolve around the personal parts of the characters, as opposed to an expanding journey that goes across uh, all of the different islands in Alola. Yeah. So, Darian, before we conclude, uh, what are your thoughts overall on the coma theory and how do you feel about it now that we've sort of reviewed it? Uh, yeah, I've never really followed the coma theory too much as a Pokemon fan because I've always dismissed it as being pretty absurd. I'm not really, I, I love theories of other games and whatnot. I would like to, I should probably look into more Pokemon theories because I don't really know many. I know yeah, about the great a... Pokemon War and a, how, a little bit about how that worked, but right. other than that, I don't really know a whole bunch about any theories. But this is one I heard a lot, and I was just like, I just don't really believe it. It's never really been, like I said, this is one of the first times I've ever looked at a little bit of research for it because I just never really yeah. <laughs> took it into account. But I think it's not really logical or viable, but that's just me personally. I know it had a little bit of a following because I got this much traction over many, many years anyway. So Yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate it fell off like a decade ago at least. But it was something that, as a kid, once I learned about it, I was really mad, obviously, because I was a child. Um, and I, I generally just never liked it. I, I mean, there's no reason to, unless you're, like, a big creepypasta fan. If you're maybe a bit older and you weren't really that into Pokemon. But if you're, like, a, a diehard Pokemon fan, let me know. Do you guys, did you guys subscribe to this theory at all? Did you like this theory? Was it something that uh, you guys 
enjoyed sort of like the the more story aspects of or were you more like uh, us and you kind of just dismissed it immediately because it just went against the nature of the franchise uh, I'll also uh, leave a link to Capsule Crew TV's Ash Coma Theory Explained. We didn't use too much of the counter arguments, and he has uh, some more additional counter arguments on that. It's also one of the more recent ones, being uh, from three years ago, so not exactly when Journeys ended, but it was where, by the point where Ash has beaten the Alola League. So we used the, um, the theory part to just sort of get caught up and introduce Darian uh, to some of the bigger parts of the theory, and most of everything that we've covered uh stems from that video as well so again i'll leave that there we're gonna put this wherever it whatever playlist probably discussions playlist and uh yeah this is us celebrating ash's one year join us next year uh next year when we i don't know rank rank his his conference battles or something i don't know uh so yeah thank you guys so much for uh listening here uh hopefully i put a lot of pretty images for you to, to cover up all the white and text and until our next video we hope you take care say bye Darren. Goodbye.